You don't know what to say. Things I depended on were gone. Mm -hmm. I realized I couldn't do it on my own. I used to want to understand. Praise God. Good evening, everybody. Say welcome, welcome, welcome out once again to Tuesday night live, Bible study live. Amen. So we're going to welcome everybody out tonight for our Bible study lesson. We're going um, to dig right in tonight. We're going to get started. We're going to open with a word of prayer, and then we're going to finish up this lesson on James tonight. Amen. Amen. If everybody would join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you, God, for being our King and our Lord, God. We thank you, Father, once again for bringing us to the house of God tonight with another opportunity to dig into this word with our fellow brothers and sisters tonight, God. We pray that you be the teacher of the word and I just to facilitate the word, God, uh, just to facilitate what it is that you give to the house tonight, Father. We pray for fresh and new insight into your word tonight, God that you will give us fresh revelation on a word that we have read numerous of times. God, we pray right now tonight that as we study this word, God, and as we leave here tonight, that we will leave with something new that will stick to our bones. It will be like meat we might be able to chew on and digest and take to the world and share with somebody else, God. But even more importantly, with sharing it, God, that we'll be able to live it and walk it out. We thank you for it right now, God, for we know that you are, will be with us. You will teach us tonight, and we will receive it, God, as we open our minds and we open our hearts to hear what the Lord is speaking to us tonight, God. We pray right now, Father, that you remove any distraction from our previous day, our earlier day, God. Remove anything that will hinder us from listening and studying with you tonight, God, and hearing your voice through the lesson tonight, God. We pray right now, Father, we lay any distractions before the altar tonight, God. We ask that you would forgive us for any sins that we have committed, God, from the lessons that we have learned from our mouth to the judgment, God. We pray right now, God, that you will forgive us for that. So as we move forward tonight, God, and hear your voice, that we will be able to hear your voice clearly and understand what it is specifically from this lesson that you are teaching to each and every individual person tonight. We thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, everybody. Hey, we want to welcome everybody out. 
This is going to be our last lesson on James for this series. Um, this was supposed to be a three to four week series, and we on what week six? Um, because y'all talk a lot. So I'm, not, I'm not gonna. I am not gonna take the blame for this. <laughs> All right, y'all talk a lot, but we thank God for the lesson. We're gonna close it out. We're gonna try to finish it up um, tonight. Last week, we're just gonna give a quick summary. Um, Last week, we finished up three, and we started with James chapter four. So last week's homework from the previous week, we had talked about the tongue. We have been dealing with the tongue and controlling the tongue on last week. We talked about that. Y'all gave some great insight on your homework assignment. Last week's homework assignment, we talked, continued talking about the, um, the tongue, but we also ended up that lesson that we were talking about the worldliness and, um, you know, how being not of this world and talking about how you resist the devil when he flees from you. And we talked about all that good stuff. But one of the biggest things that we talked about ended up being that where our homework assignment came from ended up being about judgment. And our homework assignment for the week was supposed to have been to check yourself, continue to check yourself on your tongue, but also check yourself on giving and receiving judgment. So your homework assignment was supposed to be how often did check yourself if you notice that you judge somebody Rightly or unrightly, and remember we were saying it was, we talked about the judgment, it was two different types of judgment. The sinful type of judgment is when you're judging somebody and you're condemning them for what they're doing. The other one is when you're holding it up to the standard of God, which we didn't call it judgment, we called it accountability. So and also what that meant that you, were you able to receive that from somebody else? And if somebody did come to you and say something to you, were you able to check your response to them? So I'm going to ask. You don't have to give details if you don't like, but I'm just going to ask. Did anybody experience that one way or the other this past week? Anybody say yay, nay, raise your hand, shake your hand? You did? Anybody like to share? They said no. <laughs> that's fine. Um, but that's what it was. So for the practicalities of the lesson, that's what we had stopped on. So keep all that in mind as we continue to flow with this lesson tonight, all right? And because this is going to be our last one, you will have a homework assignment, but it's more going to be like a life assignment, okay? I'm going to give you something to do, but it's going to be more like the practical, because the, the title is Practical Living, according to practical principles of whatever, y'all know what it is. <laughs> but <laughs> Yes, according to James, all right? So as we went through chapter four, we got to finish up chapter four, and we talked about the, the judgment, and we talked about how, you know, when it came down to the judgment of people, you got to be careful when you're judging people, and you're condemning them, and you're talking about people versus the true accountability part where we hold each other accountable to the word of God, and keeping in mind that we can only hold people accountable that believe what we believe, all right? So... Don't, get into, don't need to get into arguments with people that don't believe your word because what are you holding them accountable to? Because the only thing that you can judge them on is the word, which means when you judge them, you're judging yourself. So you must be also doing what you are call yourself holding somebody else accountable. That was one of the things that we said. That's why you got so much stuff going on in the church because a lot of the leaders are doing the stuff that the other people are doing and nobody's holding anybody accountable. All right? So... This week, we're going on, and we're going to finish up with James, chapter 4, and then we're going to jump into chapter 5. I think we stopped on verse 12, so we're going to start with verse 13 tonight. Um, and as we get our sound team ready with the mics, we're going to remember if anybody volunteered to read tonight, if you can read for me, read loud. Tell us what version of the word you're reading from. And tonight, we're going to start off with verse 13. And when you read, just finish out the chapter. Go through verse 13 through 17. And as we get the mics ready for the person who's going to volunteer to read, it's going to be up on the screen as well. Um, this particular part of the lesson is really, when you talk about practical living and practical principles of Christian living according to James, this little section is something to me that holds a, a concept that is very powerful, and James is very direct with it. So let's read this, and we're going to dig into this and actually get a good concept of how we truly live our life. Amen? So who's going to read for us? 
I guess I'm the only one got a mic. Okay. <laughs> I'm coming out of the New Living Translation. All right. Verse 13 says, look here, you who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. For 14. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. 15. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. 16. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans. All such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then do not do it. Amen. So let's move on to chapter 5. Because uh, do we need to elaborate on chapter 4 and the rest of that? All right, this is one of those things. Remember we started this lesson and we said James was straight to the, po the point. In studying this and hearing what he's saying, the bottom line is you hear a lot because I know I have done it in the past. I try not to do it as much, but he's talking about planning. Now, keep in mind, who, is, who are we talking to? So let's keep this in mind. We're going to do a little lesson. Who are we talking to? The 12 tribes, the Jews, the 12 tribes. That's who he's talking to. Back then, when he's talking about trading, going for a year, keep in mind, when they were trading back then, there was no currency like we have now where they could open up Shopify and start a website and make their money. So what they did, they carried their, their, their commerce, their goods on their back, and they would trade from city to city. So that person would walk from city to city, stay there for a while, trade their goods, and then go on to the next city. So in this terms of what we're talking about, this is one of the things that James is saying. So when they're making their plans, do you think James, in this particular part, is it what, do you think he's saying it's a problem because they're planning to go here? Somebody, you look, y'all been interacting for four or five weeks. We're going to finish this off. Do we think James is saying that it is a problem for them to make plans to go do these trades? No. Well, he just said in verse 2, what was it? It's okay to make plans, but are you seeking God in your plans? Did you seek God to even make the plan that you're seeking him for, if that okay. makes sense? So, yes, you can make a plan, but you got to go to God with your plan to get direction. Okay. So, sis is saying that it's not necessarily he's saying that it's wrong to make a plan. It's wrong to make a plan without seeking God first in that plan. What was he saying? Okay, that's what sis is saying. Anybody else have an interpretation of this? Look at yourself. Remember, this is practical living. So everything we talk about, we should be able to apply to our life. When you're making plans, how do you make your plans in relation to God and to what James is saying? If you make a plan for something, what do you do? When you verbalize it. Huh? This is what I plan to do. This is what I'm going to do. When you verbalize it. Huh? And then we ask God to bless it. All right, so let's dig into this real quick. And I'm sorry, I got my iPod is closing. I got to change my settings real quick. All right, so let me help. Let's help us out a little bit. James is saying when we went to verse thing, verse thirteen. Who said, look at who says, today or tomorrow, we're going to a certain place, we will stay a year, we will do business. The next question he asks in verse 14 is, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Okay? So in other words, what James is saying is not, he's not condemning the people for making their plans. Matter of fact, even though what Sister Regina said, I think is dead on before we make plans, James is not even telling the people that they need to seek God before they make this plan. In this particular situation, you understanding that he's talking to people that trade. So in order for them to make a living, they know that they have to go to 
city to city in order to trade their goods. So it's already understood that this is something they're going to have to do. So James is not condemning them for that process. But what he's saying to them is the key thing to this in verse 15, what he's telling us is what you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to this and we live, this is what we will do, this or that. What does it mean even that? A lot of times what, what happens is, in this particular case, James is telling people, we take for granted that we are just a speck on this, in speck in this thing called life. We take for granted that, or we forget that God is in control of everything. So while we are taking for granted our daily duties, our daily life, we are not giving God credit to, to know that he is allowing us to do everything that we do. Keep in mind that everything that we do in this, in this walk, we should be reminded of who's number one, who's the head nacho, who is allowing it, who is gracing us with it, and that is God. In this case, James is not belittling the people for trading. He's not even belittling for the skills. He's not, he's not condemning them for being good at what they do. But what he's saying is don't get it twisted. You're only able to do this because God is allowing you to. So whenever you make plans, we should say, if the Lord's will. You know who was a great example of the Bible who did that? One of the, in the New Testament. Who wrote most of the New Testament? Paul. In every letter that he wrote where he told somebody he was coming back, he would say, I plan to come to you, blah, 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 if the Lord's will. He, it was no deep, nothing about it. He would just plan, put his plans out, and then he would say, if the Lord's will, or the Lord be you know, willing, or something of that nature. And it was always acknowledging his role or his place. Remember how we talked about last week? Or was the week for last when we talked about how we have a place? God is the big dog, and you know, we the little dogs, and we got to make sure that we know our role. And that's what this particular lesson is about. So when it comes to this, it's really just telling us not to put too much stock in our own skill set and our own plans without trusting in God or making sure we know God is in control. Amen? Amen. Verse 17. Verse 17 says, remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then do not do it. So how many of us have made plans this week or for the future this week and have sinned? How many of us have made plans according to verses 13 through 16 that we just discussed and we've sinned? Because it says to know, a sin is to know what to do, what you ought to do, and then do not do it. Yes, you can, sis. Um, because for 13 through before you get to 16, right? Mm -hmm. At the beginning of my Bible, it says warning about self-confidence. Yep. And then when I go into the study portion of that, it does talk about a little bit what you said about making plans. But what my study Bible says, don't get mad when God changed your plans. Yep. Basically, you can make a plan, but don't get mad if God says, nope. This is not what's going to happen. This is not how it's going to happen. And I think if we take 17, it's that when God says something is going to happen or change the direction and you choose to ignore the direction that God is causing you to go to. And it says, remember, if it's a sin to know what to do and not to do it. So I think if God is directing us in a certain situation and we ignore the direction is when it becomes the sin. Okay. That's Based off of partially of what my study Bible is saying down here at the bottom. He's, and I think that's where the boasting comes in because, oh, I made my plan and I'm going to do this and it's going to turn out this way and I'm going to be able to. And God said, uh-uh, not today. Okay. But I done bragged to everybody about my plan. And then all of a sudden, my plan doesn't go that way. Now I'm embarrassed. Now I feel bad. 
now I'm like, oh my God, well, oh my God, because you didn't seek me first. So now I'm finna go in and make a mess of what you thought was, oh, I was trying to give you the mic. Uh, <laughs> amen. Okay, sister, okay, so sister Regina's saying that and according to what her study is, that it's not just that you have a plan and didn't seek God, is that if God changes your plan and then you still choose to do your own thing, then that's what the sin is, right? Okay. I, it, um, I was sitting here listening to the lesson and I was thinking about the scripture that says, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. Mm -hmm. And um, just thinking about, uh, just today I got, bad news about one of my assistants that passed away. And literally three weeks ago, prior to him leaving for the surgery, we were talking about him retiring. Mm -hmm. And he was going to drop his retirement packet and the plans that he had for his future and what he had for his wife and his children and grandchildren. And so when I was, look, not that he didn't acknowledge God and that I'm not saying that, but I was thinking about when it was saying that our life is just a vapor that you never know what tomorrow will hold because he left for a routine surgery and now today he's not here. And so, you know, when, when I think, think about that, I, I think about just the, the constant thought of acknowledging that we live in God's grace, that it's his grace and his mercy every day. So even in our plans, making sure that we say, you know, Lord, if, if it is your desire, this is my desire, that this will happen or that this, this will take place. And that's not easy to do because I think sometimes life gets us so, you know, we can come up with our own plans. Oh, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I, 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 I. Um, so it's, I, I think it's a good reminder when I was reading it. Amen. Okay, and we are sorry to hear about your coworker, Betty. Um, so what they were saying, we talk about the plans. And what Sis said is a, is a great point. It was a study body just pointed, pointed out. All, but a, another way that we look at this when we talk about that being a sin uh, as far as making our plans now that we know, the sin of it not even going as far as what Sis was saying because that is, that is definitely true what she was saying that when God, sometimes God changes our plans and then we still choose to do our own thing, you know, that's what becomes a sin. The actual sin part becomes, and follow this. I get up and I say, you know what? Next week I'm going to blah, 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 blah. All right, this is what I'm going to do. I didn't acknowledge God. So now you're making plans. You have not acknowledged who your Lord is. So now when it comes to that, here you are. You are not acknowledging God, but yet you're making plans and going on about your business. So with that being said, where are your thoughts? Where are your priorities at? Huh? They're not on God. So your mindset, and a lot of times, a lot of times what we forget, the sin does not come. This thing that we call life is a very simple and practical thing in terms of who is a head honcho and how we live our life. We talk a good talk when it comes to living Christian living and being totally committed and submitted, and submitted to God, but yet throughout our daily walk, we're not talking about the big stuff. We're talking about everyday stuff. We have a tendency to depend more on ourselves than acknowledging who God is and allowing us to do that. And so the sin comes from just this simple acknowledgement of who God is that we fail to do on a regular basis. And so he's, it's not saying that we got to walk around here saying, Lord willing, I'm going to take a step. Lord willing, I'm going to take two. No, it's not that. It's just saying when we're making plans, we start our day, God willing, and we acknowledge who he is. If we make a plan, God's willing, this is what we're going to do. And then you go on with the thoughts that you had. And the plans that he gave you in your mind are that you came up with some brilliant thoughts. You know, because keep in mind, if you, are, if you are in communication with God and you have the heart of God, when you make plans, your plans are going to be in his will. You know, you can you pray about them, you can check with them, but you don't. It's not a situation of, of everything that comes to your mind is is something negative. But if you are in a, in alignment with Him, your heart and your desires are going to be in alignment with Him. So it's just a simple matter of checking ourselves on a regular basis, and by doing so, it keeps us humble. 
And that's the biggest thing. It keeps us humble because when we're not, when we don't do that, we have a tendency to forget who we are. And then once again, we start putting too much trust in ourselves. Um, Sister Crystal said the same thing we just said. When we allow God to lead us, his plan should be our plan. Amen. All right. Anybody have anything else they want to say on that? Elder Kelly? Mike, please. Um, I think it will keep us open when he changes the plan. As Sis was saying, when you're acknowledging that and he says, oh, that's not the way I want you to go, it keeps you open and it keeps us from being disappointed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because like we can have our own plans and sometimes get so focused on how we're going to do it, even how we do what we want to accomplish. But then if God takes us a different way, we won't find ourselves being disappointed because if we acknowledge him, then we're open to the change. Amen. And that is it. I mean, that's the bottom line. So everything we said about that is true. And what Sis is saying is absolutely true. So when it comes down to a bottom line for practically how we're going to take this and apply it to our everyday life, because now you definitely held accountable for it because you have read it and you studied it. So what do we do next time we're making plans? We're going to acknowledge God. If the good process is to seek God before you start making plans, but even after you make your plans and you start verbalizing these plans, just acknowledge God in it. God, God's will and this is what we're going to do. I mean, you know how much our misdirection in our lives that we would not have if we would just follow the rules, if we would just follow this. And remember, I'm I'm not I'm speaking for me. I can't. Or let me just speak for myself. If I had just followed the rules once I learned that this is basically my life, if this is basically the rules that I should follow, if I would have been taught early on that God has a plan for you. Not your mother, not your father, not your sister, not your brother. But if God has a plan for you, if you learn the plans that God have for you, our lives would probably be so much easier. Mm -hmm. But it also goes back to the same scripture that don't get so even cocky or boastful in those plans still because you could probably still know the plan and get boastful within the plan to where again he says you know what you can't even handle this so let me change it mm -hmm. right so there goes the humble part of being able to stay humble before God, being able to stay humble for what he plans for us because his plans is for us to prosper. Okay. Amen. <laughs> I didn't say tonight. <laughs> but since you mentioned the word prosper, <laughs> and she talks about the plan that we're mentioning prosper, let's jump over to chapter 5. Remember how we talked about a couple of weeks ago and we talked about the rich people and we said when you're reading the Bible, it just seems like they just be on them rich people, you know? And I'm not going to tell them, like, since me and my wife income is up to certain levels, you be like, hey, Jesus, I mean, you the taxes, I'm telling you, look, them taxes ain't no joke. I pay more taxes. I do taxes with people. I pay more taxes than some people make. And that ain't saying we make a lot of money. I'm just saying that's how much they tax you when you reach a certain. And then it's like, well, dang, what's the purpose? But now you're going to get to this. Rich people. Let's talk about the rich people. And see why James, now we're going to figure out the difference of why James 
really was talking about the rich people earlier. Now, keep in mind, is the Bible against rich people? No. We know Jesus has some very wealthy followers, right? He talked, there was a couple people, he went and stayed at some rich people houses. So we know it ain't a totally against rich people. But when you read the Bible, it talks about rich people a lot. So now we're going to understand why do we talk about rich people so much. We're going to understand a little bit more. Um, but keep in mind, even though he's talking about the rich, these principles apply to us today, those of us who even those of us who ain't rich. Because even though we make a little bit of money, we ain't rich. By no matter of fact, we need to make more money. I'm just saying, it ain't even about all that. So I'm just saying at this particular point, it ain't about that. It's about something else. So now we're going to figure out what it is. Let's look at... Um, James chapter 5. Let me get a volunteer to read verses 1 through 4. 1 through 4. And let's get a mic. Hello. Don't forget when you read, let us Hello. get the version of the Bible that you're reading from. Um, I'll be reading from the NIV version. All right. Just verse 1. James 1 through 5. 1 4. Through, 1, 1 through, through 4. 4. Okay. Now listen, you rich people, weep and well because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted. Stop, wait, wait, wait. I can't. We, uh, you're going to read, but I had to stop on that one for a second. Now you start out a chapter talking about the rich people weeping and howling in misery for what's coming to them. So that's letting you know right now, you, he's already setting the tone for what's coming in this. And also keep in mind, in the Old Testament, and remember this is considered the first book of the New Testament, epistle that was written of the New Testament, so it will have a lot of Old Testament um, language in it. Even when it came to that, they did a lot of weeping and gnashing and, and growling and, and all that stuff back then. They talked like that. So James is already setting the tone to what's coming. Go ahead, sis. Two, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire, and you have hoarded wealth in the last days. For look at the way, look, the wages you fail to pay to the workers who mold your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters listen to this. have Say, reached. Read that part again, sis. Okay. Because I cut you off. But listen to this verse. Okay. For look. The wages you failed to pay the workers who have mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Five, you have stop, lived. Stop, stop, okay. stop. Just one through four. You got good with You got happy with that. <laughs> All right, so we set in the tone. We're talking about the rich people. Keep in mind, he's talking to the Jews that got money. But this is applying to all of us. All right? How do a lot of people think rich people get rich? Huh? Matter of fact, talk about the oil companies. We're going to put it on today. Here we are, and gas prices are way beyond higher than they've ever been. But you look at profit margins, they're making more money than they ever made in history. Okay? So, but even looking at that, so when we talk about it, James is talking to the same type of people, the rich people. But here he's talking to a, spe a specific type of person. Can somebody tell me the character of the person he's talking to? Sister Tanya and then Brother D. If I'm looking at it correctly, a hoarder. Someone who hoards it and keeps it for themselves. A hoarder keeps it for himself. Brother D. You're talking about a person who, <laughs> who basically just cheats people. You know, you work them as slaves. You pay them a little bit of money or you just don't pay them at all. Okay. Somebody cheat people. Go ahead, sis. A rotten person. Yeah, hey, rotten. That's what the word said. They rotten. Go ahead, Elder Kelly. So I would say somebody who's greedy and, and doesn't give to others. Greedy and doesn't give to others. What did we say when we talked about the rich people before? The purpose of wealth is what? It's to bless others. The purpose of anything that we get on this earth, our main purpose is to do what? To tell is we got to be, we are a representation of Jesus Christ. God blesses us to be a blessing to somebody else. Everything we do, and as you will see, further down in the lesson, it's going to get a little deeper um, with this. Everything we do is a representation of God. So James is talking to these rich folks. 
And his bottom line is telling them, like he said, they're rotten, they're cheating people, they're hoarding people, they're hoarding money. Bottom line is they're gaining this wealth for themselves. All right? And they got workers. Here's the thing that got me. Because he's talking all this talk about them, but then it gets to the part where he says, the Lord, the cries of those in, uh, who have harvested your field, New Living Translation, so the people who did your work, they've been complaining and complaining and complaining and crying out, and their cries have reached the ears of the Lord. So this is what he's saying. So this is so you're cheating people to the point, and it's not even about cheating in that sense. It's just bottom line is you didn't give them their fair wage. And I, I will stress this. The word says the poor will be with us always. Everybody is not going to be rich. But that does not mean you cheat those. Keep in mind, one of the biggest things, issues that things that we have is most people will understand, even then James is talking in this particular concept, the poor, there was a different type of justice for the poor and for the rich. It was just, it has always been that way. It has always been that way. So the poor gets their justice from the man upstairs. Now, until people start taking it to their own hands, but that's, we trying to be Christians, so we're going to do this another way. But James is even talking about that now. Same concept that was happening way back then. We had a comment? No comment? All right, we're good. All right, so we're talking about this. and he, Now, this is people that's working for, for James. Now, I'm going to ask y'all a question, because we're talking about practical living here. How many people have you wronged that you think have been crying out to God that you have not rectified? Somebody that you cheated, or you wronged, or you did something to. Because right now, he's talking about wealthy people, but, you know, it ain't all about wealthy people. How many of us have actually done something wrong? How many of us cheated on the paper, took credit for something on ours? Just, you know, took credit for something one hour and didn't acknowledge somebody for something else they have done that belonged to them. You know? And so you got people that are sitting back just feeling bad about something you're doing. Are you getting credit for something that their, their work, their stuff? You know, different things. Just, that's just one example. But those examples can be applied to other places. Sister Tanya? So um, just talking about rich is not necessarily, I'll talk, we're talking here monetarily but there's so much that we're rich in, with rich with knowledge. You know, God has given us some wisdom on some things and stuff like that. So even being hoarders of those different things and not sharing that wealth of knowledge to help somebody else to become even rich in that area of knowledge themselves to be able to make the gold and the silver or whatever the case might be. So it's so many ways to me when I look at it that I look at that word rich, not just on a, I know it's, it's talking monetarily here, mm -hmm. but then just, and as we said, this is he's talking to what the twelve tribes. So he's talking to those who are, if I'm understanding correctly, a part of the body. Mm -hmm. You know, so even us in the house of God, that God gives us so much riches. You know, you know, we're just just each and every day that we wake up, we're richly blessed to be a blessing to someone else. So, in that sense, I, I was just thinking of that word rich, um, for their context for me. Okay, that's a good way to apply that. We got it. Let's talk now. Let, let's look at the richness of this that we're talking about here. Sis, read. Mm -hmm. But let, it's a lot. Look at verse five and six, though, and let's let's talk about just how much it really is. See, right now we're just talking about what happens, but look at verse five and six. Somebody read that for me. I'm reading from the NLT version. Yes, ma'am. Verse 5. You have sent you have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. Mm -hmm. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. Mm -hmm. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. Now stop. So he basically saying that you 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 just fatten yourself like a fattened cow calf for the slaughter. Which slaughter you think they talking about? 
he's talking about. Hmm? Hmm? And you have condemned yourself, huh? Yeah, judgment. He's talking about, James is talking about the last days. He's talking about the last days. So think about this. Everything that they got, he's talking about it's going to be rotten. Your money, your gold is going to be rusted. It's going to be, so when the last days come, everybody that's hoarding all this stuff, and you're hoarding it and you're cheating people to gain more, you gain more, all your desires are put on earthly goods. You know, you're hoarding this, you're hoarding knowledge that God has given you to share with somebody else and you're holding on to it, all that stuff is going to be burnt up. It's going to be burnt up and gone. So, sis, got a question or comment? Um, I had a comment. It was uh, just the imagery that I had of um, the Titanic. Um, I don't know if you all have seen the movie, but you know at the beginning of the movie where they um, are looking at all the things that was on the Titanic um, under the water, mm -hmm. all corroded and nasty looking. But you know, they created the Titanic as one of the biggest boats and you know how expensive it was and all these great things. So, you know, people just to think about how we as people get so caught up on, you know, um, the presentation of things, the uh, materialistic part of things. Um, but just to see how quickly God can switch something real quick, and it's nothing. Mm. Amen to that. Since you have a coming. I guess, too, when we take a look at five and six, and we take a look at what's going on in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And it says, you have condemned and killed the innocent people. Right? How many innocent people are dying right now for mm -hmm. no reason? F well, for a reason because gun control. Because these people are steady getting fatter. What did it say? You spent years on the earth luxury satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. Mm hmm for the days of slaughter. And so many people are being slaughtered today. And it's just, the words right now are just coming alive. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it's, I'm not gonna say it's scary, but it's scary. To see that we know nothing is new up under the sun, we know God plans things happen and for you to be able to see something that has been written and we're not prepared for it. Mm -hmm. We are not. We are not prepared for it. I was, um, when I was thinking about um, what they were saying about fattening yourself for the day of slaughter, and this is not that I have any problem with the message or word of prosperity, but I often think about the mega churches and I th it, 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 it always bewildered me how leaders would be in private jets and, and all of these things and you have people in your congregation who are not eating. Mm -hmm. And something about that just did not and does not sit well in my spirit that that's all God. Not that God won't bless, but sometimes people get to the point where they're seeking so much elevation and titles and this and that. But how, when, when I look at that, to hear they're getting fat, but you got people that you're still taking an offering from that don't even know how they're going to pay their light bill. You know, and, and, and so when I think about that, that's what I think, because I believe that if God is blessing with prosperity and we live by the spiritual principle, that it is to bless others, then that means that somebody need to be paying off somebody's debt in the church. We need to have a debt-free church. Mm -hmm. We need, need to make sure everybody in the body is, you know, is, mm -hmm. is eating well and those type things. And so when I think about that, that's what this was.
Elder Kelly, you dropped the mic. Oh, no, it didn't. But, you know, and I'm, tr- <laughs> and I'm, I'm clunking up in the church house, you know, barely with oil in my car, and you got your private jet pulled. And, again, I don't have nothing against prosperity, but I think that the wealth should be distributed. And so when I just look at this, this is what it kind of reminds me of. It's like at what point do you feel blessed enough? <laughs> so the concept, I got That's the hand back there. Hand here. Okay, we got Sister Tanya and then Brother D. Sister Tanya, then Brother D. Oh, okay. Um, I was just thinking what Elder Kelly was saying is almost as if the blessing became their God. Mm-hmm. You know, the blessing became. And that's where I believe we go back to, you know, that, that dangerous um, I mean, I think I even go back to four, <laughs> you know, that latter part of four, just, you know, it becomes sinful, you know, because, you know, that what God has given you, that this wealth that he has allowed you, he says, he, um, he gives us wealth, riches come from him. And so when we don't acknowledge those riches as coming from him, and we hoard, or we don't be a blessing, or that or that riches that he's given us became a God, then we sin, you know, it became an idol. It became more about us or the individual who obtained it than about who gave it to us so that we can do it, so that, I mean, Mm -hmm. use it to build up the kingdom of God. Amen. Brother D? Well, she just said exactly what I was gonna say. But um, if I can just piggyback off of what um, Elder was saying. Also, that also becomes, um, when we talk about the wealth not being distributed, I think that that's what happens um, in the world why um, so many people are also turned away from church and the message that we are supposed to bring to the world is because they start looking at what the pastors have, right, and what the congregation doesn't, don't have, right? They're seeing the pastors with the jets. They're seeing the pastors with the mega houses, and they're seeing the rest of the congregation struggling. So instead of the message that we're supposed to be reaching and, and, and teaching them and letting them know about God, Jesus Christ, um, all they're seeing is pastors getting rich, pastors being on TV and having TV shows, instead, and, and all about them instead of the message about God, you know, our Savior. Um, and I think that that is a, also a big problem that people are getting turned away from the church because it's, now it's not about God. It's, it's, it's all about show show business and it's about them having money and dressing and being of the world instead of separating the world Mm -hmm. from who we're supposed to be focused on and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Just going back to Elder Kelly and I think that goes back to the part of judgment and accountability. When do we start holding people accountable? When do we start judging people with the word of God? When do we take the word and say, okay, you know what? You don't want to listen to me. Here you go. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm not using my words. I'm just going to use the word of God. Um, and And do that. When are we going to use the accountability piece of this. And again, I may be also talking to myself. Well, sis, you keep saying that tonight, but the reality is we're all talking to ourselves. Mm-hmm. And this this whole lesson has bit all of us, <laughs> I know I can speak for me, teaching the lesson. Um, we got another comment, then we're going to jump down because we're we going to hit this other part. It's, and you said, you know, holding accountable. Huh? Now, but, you know, and like the, you said, the accountability through the word of God. So that means the person that is being held accountable has to believe in what the word of God is saying. Mm-hmm. Because if you have no, if you won't allow the conviction of the word of God to, you know, let the word of God, the accountability, the conviction to, to enter in your heart as the individual who's being held accountable, then it, it goes no further. You know, yeah, it's... it's So they proclaim that they are believers. So we have to speak the word. So 
based off of what they are preaching, based off of what they are proclaiming, they are believers. So today, who going to hold these people accountable? And so that the, this is one of the reasons, like I told you before, when we first started studying this book, and I said there was different people who didn't like the book of James, didn't even think it should have been in the Bible. Why? Because of the way James talked about some of the practicalities of certain things. The, the, we had said before, I, the prosperity message is one of those messages that has to be put into proper perspective. Because, and, and I'm going to look at a different point. Because you look at when they built, when they went back to build the temple and they asked people to bring stuff, they brought, so mu- they brought more stuff than they needed to build the temple. They had to put stuff aside. So the, the temple was, was always taken care of. The, the priests was always taken care of. They were getting the best of the best because God gave, told them they could eat certain stuff. So they were always well taken care of when they were doing what they were supposed to do. So when you put things into perspective, as Elder Kelly was saying, there's a difference between making sure your leaders are well taken care of for what they do and your leaders hoarding and taking advantage of the congregation. And that's when the congregation has to get to the point of, at that particular point, holding people accountable. If you have a congregation and you're paying your pastor a seven-figure salary, but yet the church's in debt, or you got people that are coming, or you're able to pay this salary because you have a VIP section in your church, and those are the people that are getting catered to as a VIP section and not the other people who are struggling, like she was saying, maybe to pay the light bill, but they're still paying a faithful tithe. So when you do the prosperity, it's about holding stuff accountable because one thing, like we said, the Bible says we are to take care of our leaders. So that we're not saying leaders are not supposed to be well taken care of. My personal opinion is the pastor should not have to have a second job. That's just my personal opinion. But that's my personal opinion. You know, can all churches afford to pay a pastor a fair wage to that point where they can retire off of that and not have to have another job. No, all churches can't afford to do that. But at the same time, like we were saying, this message is talking about, when we're talking about James and applying this, this is about hoarding. Because you gotta question things when pastors have to have private jets and that becomes a must and you got people in the congregation that are still struggling with certain stuff. So that's when you put things in perspective of Where's the, when the church is being blessed, the church is blessed to bless others. If all the blessings are staying in the house, then we got a problem. Say that again. Yeah, even the church can be a hoarder. If all the blessings are staying in the house, then you have a problem. If the church is getting blessed, every time we're blessed with something, we should be planning something, some type of ministry. One of the biggest mistakes that churches make is worrying about a savings account. Why do I say that? Not, huh? Is worrying about a savings account. Not because we're saying you shouldn't have a savings, but when your savings is becomes your top priority and not ministry, then you're hoarding. You're having a problem with that because your top priority should be ministry. Have a savings account that's practical. But then when you reach a practical point to where you're, you're okay, because even back then they put stuff in the storehouse, right? But you also have to be able to continue to do ministry. If we are afraid to do another ministry because we are afraid or we don't have a savings or we got to put this in this account or, or this savings account, then you got to question your motives on certain things. Because, and the reason I say, and the only reason I'm saying that is because we, it's, it's, even us as a church, we get caught up in the hoarding of things. I'm not talking about you individually in your own house. I'm talking about the church. Because the church's job is to do ministry. A church's job is to do ministry and to make sure your bills are paid. I think from what I've seen, we have done very well. We have a, a savings account that we can get through a month or two with bills and we're doing well with that. We're not hoarding money in that sense. And it's something we got, you know, we got a little something going to savings you know, each time, but it's not to the point of we're more worried about a savings account than we're worried about doing the ministry. And that's the difference. So even churches, so I don't want us to get caught up in the, the mega preachers, 
of stuff. But even the church got to look. We, even us, at these small churches, sometimes have to look at where our motives are. Go ahead. Uh, you already said the word, but you said uh, priority. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, priorities just aren't in order. And it made me think of with hoarding, like when we had COVID uh, at Arise, um, you know, people were hoarding uh, toilet mm -hmm. tissue and Clorox wipes and gloves and everything. So, <laughs> but it made me think specifically about BCDC because there were times where we would come to the church um, during COVID and DWALT was passing out Clorox, um, you know, containers mm -hmm. or Clorox wipe containers. And he didn't have to do that. He could have kept that in his house. Like we need all these wipes. But, <laughs> but he was, you know, gracious enough to still help the church and then the church then in turn help people, you know. So or Amen. even when we were sending out messages on um um Messenger, Facebook, talking about, oh, we saw this in Hope Mills, Walmart. You know, that's just what you're we're supposed to do as Christians in general. So Amen. All right, one more comment on this part and we're we gonna get the next part because we got to finish that to close out the, the practicality of the power of this, because the latter part of this is where the power comes from. Go ahead, sis. It, it makes me think of stewardship. What are you going to do? We're yep. being a steward over what God has blessed us with, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then also, like you said, with the savings, even in your personal, you know, because we are the church, and so God blesses us to be able to, even from our own personal storehouse, to be able to give. Even if it's about a storehouse, bring it into the house of God. All of us have our own personal storehouses and savings and stuff. So even just having a plan on what you're going to do, you know, um, with your savings. You know, yes, you save, you have it for a rainy day or whatever the case might be, but then you also have plans that you have <laughs> attached to, you know, yeah, your savings funds. and what you do. Your, yeah. So uh, just being steward, uh, being a good steward. A or good steward. And that's the biggest thing is to remember, when you die, you're not taking this with you. You know what I mean? We're leaving the wealth for our children and our children's children. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know. I, when I was little, I, I didn't think I was gonna, the earth was going to be this, around this long. I heard the end of time message so long. So we don't know when it's coming, but we know it's coming. But the reality is we plan God's willing. As we just said, God's will, we make plans for the future. But you don't put those plans ahead of God's plan. That's the key. We got to keep it all in perspective. Amen? All right, so and look. We got to get to the bottom part. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to run through verses 7 through 12. And it's going to hit some of y'all in the gut. Because I got a couple of people in here. I know I got a couple of people in here right now that do not agree with this. And they got a problem with this. And it's going to hit you in the gut. But we're going to run through it. We're going to let you, we're going to have a comment or two. But before we leave here, we are going to read verses 13 through, at least 13 through 16. We got to finish that. But verses 7 through 12, we're going to run through real quick. So somebody got a mic. Yes. You ready to read? I'm ready. Uh, Version. Reading from the New Living Translation. Yeah. Um, Verse 7 states, Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for valuable harvest to ripen. Eight, you too must, pay, must be patient. Take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. Nine, don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. Mm. Ten, come on now. For... Examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. 11, we give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. 12, but most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else, just a simple just say a simple yes or no that you will not sin and be condemned. Okay. Now, verse 12 stands alone. We're going to touch on it. Bottom line is, if you, if you got to add a bunch of words to get somebody to believe you saying yes or no, then you need to check yourself. 
That's all of that, and that's what it means. Your yes is a yes, your no is a no. Don't be making no vows, you know, don't be committing, don't be swearing on the Bible, and all that, no, yes, yes, that's it, no. Huh? <laughs> yes or no, when James said that your yay be yay, and your no be no. So your yes can be a God's willing. We can throw a God's willing in there, all right? God's willing. We'll throw a God's willing in there, all right? I saw hands. We ain't touching them hands right now. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Seven through 12. And I said it's going to put some of us in the good. But just to keep it simple, why do we believe Martin Luther King was more received than Malcolm X? Huh? Say that again. He did everything in his book. And from 7 through 12 is what he did. He got it from, what was it, Gandhi, I think it was, that he, he, was, that he got the delivery from. But he did. Malcolm X did it the exact opposite of what's in here, in the beginning. We ain't going to talk about the latter part. I'm just talking about how he's received. Because in the end, we ain't getting to the history, but we know if them, what, they whatever got together, we have a whole different United States right now. But we ain't talking about that. Because in the end, it, he was a different brother. But in the beginning, this is what, he went opposite of what the message was. Now, even today, in the Black Lives Matter movement, and I'm going to put it out there, I'm saying it, that don't, because you can get, we can have a debate from here to the end of the world, to China. The bottom line is I'm talking about the book. Now, does that mean you don't protest? You don't do, so? absolutely not. You feel free to protest any, but the book, you know how we say we hold people accountable according to the book? This is why certain people are not received by certain things because of the way they respond to certain things. Now, does that believe that? Because, you know, Deacon Kelly has protested a time or two on a certain thing. So this ain't talking about, I'm not judging how things were handled. I'm judging how things are being responded to in terms of, of what the word of God is saying. And that's all Deacon Kelly's saying. So what everybody else believe about whatever, I'm just giving you practical example of what the word is saying, how we should respond. Because he's talking to the same people that he just said was being cheated and God has heard their cries. So he, this is who he's talking to now. He shifted from talking to the people who was oppressing them because he told the people that's oppressing them, you're going to be held accountable by God. But yet he turns right around and tells the people who are, doing, who are being oppressed how to handle the oppression. Why do you think this was the case? It was the very exact same reason why he talked about the first people, the rich people being, um, putting their faith in their, in their money. And how we talked about, even we talked about the last time, it's about knowing your order. Because if you can endure something to the end and put your faith in God, then, and still make it through, do you not think your blessings in the end? Because we're playing the long game. And the long game is a heavenly, uh, eternal life. So if we can endure a little something here on the earth and still give God his glory, then he has no problem giving you eternal life. And that's the, the outcome, the outlook that we tend to forget as Christians is that part. Now, even Martin Luther King, even though he followed this, had his moments. We had moments, so I'm not, I'm not judging nobody or nothing. I'm just telling you what the book said. Now, Brother D, be my guest. You've been itching for this one since you read it. Come on. And then we got to touch the next verse. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> I'm just going to say, so um, I just wanted to touch on, you know, when it, when it was talking about the part of the yes and no, right, um, I just had a question, actually. Um, so it's saying the oath and yes and no. So this is one of the questions I've always had, right? Mm -hmm. And it's talking about not um, not swearing and stuff like that, taking an oath, never take an oath. Um, it's, it's a question I've always had, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that goes to, like, even when we go into, like, the courthouses and stuff like that, right? Um, and they ask us to put our hand on the Bible and stuff. When, when it's talking about that, I've always wanted to know on this scripture, right, does that mean that we can 
say that we, uh, because of our religion, we choose not to do that mm -hmm. uh, because that's taking the oath? Or, you know, I always wanted to ask that question. When I was reading this this week, this week I really wanted to know that question. That's you why I was kind of itching. It is not a requirement for you to do that. Okay. But a lot of people do that because, number one, there's a separation between church and state. Okay. But what some people do, I have seen it done, I have done it before, is they say, when they say swear, I say, I will affirm. Because I'm not swearing. Okay, I, yeah. I would say, I affirm. Yeah, I affirm what I'm saying is going to be the truth. <laughs> That's all you're getting from me. You want anything else, then I can't be no witness here. Okay, when I read that this week, I was like, whoa, whoa, I've been doing this wrong. <laughs> yep. All right, thank you. I want there to is know. a separation from the church and state, so some people don't. Um, all right, we got enough time for one. Or look, I'm going to give y'all one or two more comments before we move on. All right. So as we talked about that, you remember we, we talked about all of this and we and we remember we holding people accountable for what the words say. And James is talking about being the patience, the patience and endurance. Not Deacon Kelly. Because Deacon Kelly ain't always patient, he ain't always endure to the to very well. I'm just saying. But go ahead, bro. Oh, you good. You good. So Moving on, as we talked about the next part, here comes the part of this where James is giving you, okay, how are you going to get through all this stuff? All right? We done did all this talking. Now we're talking to them. Now he's talking to the people that you talked to. The, he done talked to the people who did the oppression, told them what's going to happen to them. He even talked to the people who's been oppressed, telling them this is how you get through this. This is what you do. Because if you do this, in the end, you're going to be the one that has the best reward in the end. Because you're going to be the one walking around on streets paid of gold. That's so pure. You can't, you know what I'm saying? You're going to be doing all that in the end. If you do, if you do this, this is what your reward is going to be. But now he's telling you, now I'm going to be honest, because I get tired of people telling, and this is what happens with the frustration, why, you know, the, even, and I mentioned the Black Lives Movement, not because of the movement itself, is because some of the events that took place out of the movement and the frustrations that came out and how people expressed their frustrations. So it's not the movement, but how frustrations were exhibited. But now James is telling you, how do you deal with those frustrations without doing, dealing with them in a way that's going to be perceived negatively with everybody else? So now James is telling you, point blank, this is how you do it. Verse 13, go ahead, bro. Verse 13, I'm reading out the New Living Translation. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Stop. <laughs> you hear that, and the first thing you think, look, I'm tired of people telling me to pray. But the reality is, you got to, because he's talking to believers here. If you are a believer and you're suffering through hardship, you have to pray. I'm a therapist. My wife is a therapist. We good at what we do. But don't come talk to us if you ain't prayed to God about it. Mm. Because we're going to help you with our process with that. But it goes a whole lot better when you done prayed to God and you can get some God. Then we can help you process through that, too. You know what I'm saying? Just have, but talk to God. Pray about it. Because we are talking to believers here. So for a believer to be tired of somebody telling them to pray, that's a problem. Go ahead, bro. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Except for Deacon Kelly. <laughs> they tell Deacon Kelly not to sing. So. <laughs> Verse 14. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. 15. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Verse 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of the righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. 17, Elijah was, excuse me, Elijah was as human as we are, and yet he prayed earnestly that no 
rain would fall. None will, excuse me, none fell for three and a half years. 18. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Crop. Crops, excuse me. Bottom line is look. That whole section is really talking to the believers, and we're talking about the power of prayer. I'll ask once again, and I've asked this before, where is the power in prayer in the church today? So this is, this is a situation, this is a problem. How many of you have been sick and you actually called the elders or the leaders? Well, look, sis has. I mean, she has. I have. I ain't going to tell a story. I'll call the pastor if I get sick. But the point is, who do you know can get a prayer through for you? Who do you want putting oil on you? Do you know the people that you worship with enough to know that they can come and anoint you and you feel okay? So one of the things that we, the problems that we have in the church is we don't, you know, we don't know. Do you know who has the power? Do you know who living the life that they walk in and they're praying about? Who's living this practical principles of Christian living like according to James? Because if they're not, don't have them putting their hands on you. Be very, very, very careful when people lay hands on you. Do not, I'm going to say this, do not be afraid to say no thank you when somebody wants to put their hands on you. If you are not sure of who they are or their character, don't be afraid to say no, I, I, not right now. You know, you can say it respectfully because you got to be careful. You got to know who's laying their hands on you at all times. He's saying call the elders. This man saying Elijah prayed and told her to stop raining. God, make this th three and a half years. And it did not rain. He's telling, they had a thing back then with the anointing oil. Now, their anointing oil was a little different than, you know, they were talking about anointing oil. If you look at it, some studies said there was an oil that was a sick oil that they had that had certain healing powers. It was the anointing oil that they might have been talking about if you look at some of the historians, but the point is they called the elders to do that. You know what I'm saying? To pray over you. And even when it's saying, if you're happy, how many of you actually go around singing praises? Are you singing? Are you just singing? Are you singing praises? Praises to who? Right. So he's telling you what to do in all of these situations. And the problem is here we are, all this stuff that we just talked about, we're going through. It goes back to one thing, the power of prayer. It goes back to the power of prayer, talking about God. Because the elders, you can call the elders, I'll be honest with you. If you call, people have called, if people call me about certain things and I know I ain't been praying like I've been praying, I'm, I, call, I call somebody else. If they don't, if I've been in my prayer closet and I've been good and I'm like, all right, you know, then we're going to pray. I'll pray with them. Because one thing I don't want is somebody's conscience to be on, on me because I'm sitting there fronting like I can get a prayer through knowing the whole while that I'm just, I'm in, probably in a worse shape than they in because I'm fronting. So there's no way that I'm going to put that on my, on my conscience like that. Um, yes. And then we're going to finish this off with 19 and 20, because when y'all read that, yeah. telling you. Oh, I, I just had a question. You said. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So you said where, um, I guess, where prayer stands today. And some, I, I'm, I, I, can't, I can only assume that some may not know or may know that you can call upon the elders and the elders can pray over you. But, you know, sometimes, I guess, you know, I guess in the body of Christ, yes, that's good, but you, I think you spoke something so uh, relevant because you don't know where anybody's prayer life is, and so mm -hmm. I may not be like, mm. and, and in a sense, it, is it some type of judgment there to be like, I, I don't know if I can go to such and such, and I know they're an elder, and I know that they may can, but I may not know where your prayer life is. So some people may opt not to do it just you know, just off of that, and or for the ones who are coming in, they may not know that scripture. So sometimes 
even when they're sitting in the pew in the church and they're coming in, they may never go to the altar because they don't know the word or, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. So before I, I, I come, yeah. before I comment on that, you said you had a question, but I didn't oh, necessarily yeah, hear well, a question. Oh, yeah, well, that, I guess, in a nutshell, that's what it was. So you had a comment. I, I guess, I guess, I mean, we don't know where people's prayer life is. <laughs> I mean, we could say or okay. we can assume, but that doesn't mean that I may know fully, you know? You know what, sis? And I see you, have, you are absolutely 100% right. You got a bunch of hands that we don't know, and that's a problem. That is a problem that we don't know. But you know how you can know? See how people pray when they get up on that pulpit. I ain't talking about people calling down the rains of heaven. I'm not talking about that. Because some people can call down the rains of heaven and ain't step and ain't prayed a prayer in whatever. That's just because I went to speech school. I know how to add my yeas and my nays and emphasize these words here and there. We ain't talking about that. And because humans are so emotional, I can play on the emotions because they don't take but one person to say amen, and I jump on that, and then I start raising my voice, and then somebody else then said amen, and we amen and, and, and hollering the stuff, and we don't even know what the person's praying because we're flowing what everybody else said. We're not talking about that. But you can tell a person's prayer life by the fruit that they bear. And when, the, when people are in front of the church and they're praying, the corporate prayer and certain things, if you are in your closet or you're praying, whatever, you can tell who's been praying to God. You trust me, you, you, you can tell. And if you can't tell, then we get in our prayer closet some more. But that is a problem. But I know you can tell, whether you believe it or not. You can tell. I, is that you can tell. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Um, I think and with the, the statement that um, um, Sister Serena was, was sharing with that, then that's a message to us, to the elders. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's okay. Even for that question to be, you know, how do we know if that elder is, is, is in constant prayer or is in, has, a, has a prayer life or whatever. So that is, um, to me, is like a message to those who are elders in the body of Christ that, okay, it's important that you remain, you know, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Stay connected, you know, because there's going to be somebody who's going to need to call on you as in the assignment that was given to you as an elder. You know, not to take the assignment that God has placed mm -hmm. you in as an elder um, lightly. Right. Because there's this scripture right here that says, okay, elders, there's going to be sick people who are going to be calling upon you to pray over them. Are you going to be ready to do that? You know, so it's so that and that to answer that, you know, to be able to answer that question, you know, that that goes back to even the elders who've been assigned in that area. All right, Elder Kelly. Note taken. What I was going to say, though, is the Bible makes it very clear. You watch the fruit mm -hmm. of their life. Um, people that have a prayer life, it is not about eloquent speech. Yep. You have people that have been called to eldership that are shy and don't even like getting in front of people, mm -hmm. but know how to get a word into the Lord in their intercessive, you know, in, in whether third watch, fourth watch, second, whatever it is. So you watch the fruit of people's lives. You, there's one thing about the anointing of God is that you experience the anointing. When you're around that person, when you hear that person, when you watch their lifestyle, it is undeniable when people are walking with God. You know, the Bible says that in, when he abides, you know, things in you, it, it has to submit. And so you kind of know, I know when I'm around Dominique and I know when I see the anointing of God and when it's Dominique. And it should be the same thing with Elder Kelly or anybody else because the anointing of God is undeniable. So I was going to say that. But the other beautiful thing about this scripture is it says the prayers of the righteous avail of much. And all of us have been called to be righteous. You don't have to have a title on to be that. And that's one of the things that I love about our body is the teaching <laughs> that if you don't know how to pray, then as Sister Tanya was saying earlier, the leaders should not hoard that type of knowledge to teach you how to get a word through into God because that's what this is all about. So Verse when 16. just it was a, a town hall meeting and I was so 
just elated when I heard that we have a prayer ministry. Come on, prayer ministry. And it's not just about just the shut in, but learning and practical teachings of how to pray. Because people assume that when you accept Christ, that you know how to do these things. And it's, it's not, that's, it just doesn't happen by osmosis. This is why we have to teach one another, why we have to show one another. And sometimes it takes holding you by your hand. When somebody taught me how to pray, at first I, I, I didn't know. It, it, I had a spiritual mother who would sit beside me and would pray. And she said, this is what you say. This is what you do now. When you go home, you do it. And you'll know when God is listening to you when your prayers begin to be answered. And so that's what it's all about, the teaching, these moments right here. Amen. And as she's talking about the teaching, we did a Bible study on prayer and different things on, how, on, on different prayer. All right. Any more comments? We got comments? Who? All right. Right now. <laughs> raise your hand if you got a comment. Because this is it. I know, but this is it. Look at these three hands. Because we got two verses we're going to get to. We're going to finish this because y'all going to be here because y'all still talking. So raise your hand. Sound team, take care of that. Them the last three on this section. Go ahead. All right. All right. So um, I, I don't consider myself in particular uh, necessarily a babe in Christ. I don't consider myself up there with y'all either. But I <laughs> Y'all up there. I'm like a teenager in Christ. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I like that. I like that. I, <laughs> I like that. Go ahead. Go you ahead. know, but um, as for me and the other teenagers in Christ, um, I would say <laughs> that. <laughs> right. But, no, I would say that um, it's not necessarily, and that's to go back to your question, um, that's not, it, I don't think it's necessarily um, uh uh, uncomfortability of coming to those to pray for us. Um, I mean, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, I'll speak for myself. But I know that for me, um, I know that you all have a lot on your shoulders already. And so with me being a teenager and not a babe, there's steps that I know that there's an order to take. And so if that means going to Liz or RJ, or, you know, someone who was closer to my level before getting to y'all to worry about stuff like that. Um, not to say that y'all can't and that y'all y'all ain't there for me. I, okay. <laughs> I'm not saying y'all not there for me. But I'm saying that, you know, I think that that's probably where the barrier is at times. Not necessarily for those who, because there are some people that don't feel comfortable and they just don't. But then there's other people like me that feel comfortable, but I see all that y'all already have, if that makes sense. And you know what, sis, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for all the leaders. We respect that. But the good thing that you said in there goes back to verse 16. It says, Converse your, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. You know, because the earnest prayers, as long as you know somebody in the body that's righteous and they can pray, it, look, titles are titles. But if you know somebody that can get a prayer through, by all means. You know what I'm saying? Be, yep. That's too busy. Because we will not. And you, that's something that we have said. Right. Right. So there, it, it is not. And as we say, as leaders, we have been in those situations. People have come to us at different times for different things. And like we said, Deacon Kelly and beyond taking a problem to somebody else. Because I've told some of y'all, you know, I don't know, but I'll go talk to him soon. Or I'll pray, I'll ask so and so. You know what, let me call my wife on that. And she would say, baby, I, I need you to pray for so and so, or whatever. Because we're a team. I'll call pastor. I've been times that I've called first lady. I've, I'll call my sisters in when I need something. You know what I'm saying? So we all know. We're family. And as long, like I said, you will know. Who's next? So... Going back to that, I think what happens when we start talking about the babes of Christ or start talking about people who don't know, I think the best way to direct them is to keep coming. Because the only way that you're going to be able to begin to confess is when you start trusting people. And trusting people on a level 
and to be able to know that they're going to hold you accountable. Not to trust them to go and just tell your business too, but trust them and knowing that, well, if I go to my sister or I begin to trust or I feel comfortable enough, because if you are in a place where God's word is being taught, the word itself is going to convict you, the word itself is going to deliver you, the word itself is going to make you feel that you are free enough, right? Free enough to be able to go to somebody and say, you know what, I'm in a place right now where I really need somebody to direct me here on how to pray. Because again, we can quote unquote think we know how to pray or say the right words, but if we're not praying from here, then we really ain't saying nothing either. We're just praying with our own strength, mm -hmm. and, but not praying with the word of God ourselves. So I think as we begin to grow, as people begin to come, and as people begin to trust the word of God that is being preached across the pulpit, and it is rightly divided, it helps people to become free to be able to confess some sins to people or if you become free well I don't care what you know what I used to do because I'm now free because I can now tell my testimony so guess what because it's going to help you 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 and you because y'all look just like me so I think if we become that church to where the new people the pick people, the mic up please pick the mic I'm sorry up. when we become that church where people can be free and we come in with the love of Christ and not judgmental but accountable to those things yeah we become that church Amen. Um, and that just helps us to be able to grow to be able to recognize to be able to see hey we got some new people in here and we got to figure out how to get them to feel comfortable enough to be able to so yes that helps Amen. Before Liz comments, Sister Chardet said, needing prayer and needing our brother or sister should never be a burden as a believer. Amen. And we got some, that's good, Minister Regina. Go ahead. Okay. So, I'm getting back to your question, Serge, comments is, how do we know? Like, we don't, you know, we, we know who's in place, but do we know their prayer life? Do we know that it's authentic? And so listening to everybody and just self-reflection as well I was just hearing we have to become comfortable with God like on both ends so I know that when I'm in my area like I'm praying but I don't really know how I don't believe for myself that God is hearing me God I know you're putting me on somebody's heart to pray for me Mm. I, I just trust you so much, and I have that relationship with you that I know. Somebody going to wake up. I'm going to get a text message. I'm going to get a call. Somebody is going to help me through this. And then on the opposite end, as intercessors, as ministers, just people in the body of Christ, we have to be comfortable with God that the things that he, he gives us a burden for, the things that he asks us to pray about, and it's like, God, I don't know what I'm praying, but I'm praying. I heard you say it, so I'm going to say it. Everybody looking at me like I'm crazy, but I'm going to say it because you said it. We have to be comfortable just speaking the word of God. God, when you hide the word of God in your heart, you don't even know. Sometimes I'll be praying stuff. I didn't even know that was a scripture until, like, maybe a year later. Oh, that's in the book? Okay. I'm one with God, and I, I'm not going to lie. When you, when Charisma even mentioned my name, I was trying not to, you know, cry because that's my girl. I'm always going to cover her in prayer. But just hearing, like, I see God in you because sometimes you show up and, you know, you get to talking, hey, girl, how you doing? This my day, and all right, and then you shift and you just saying stuff. You don't know what you're saying. But then you see it on your brother or your sister's face, like, okay, that's exactly what they needed to hear. And God had me in this place, and God put that word in my heart, or God had me to pray that thing for a reason. Not to ramble. We have to become comfortable with God. 
And for those babes in Christ, we have to we have to live a life of demonstration. I'm comfortable with God, and this is the result. Freedom, peace mm. of mind, whatever it may be. Amen. I know, I know. I, I'm sorry, though. <laughs> I, I just want to say, just back back. That's why Cornelia and fellowship and Is your so mic on? I can oh, that's why, you know, you said talk loud. Okay, that's why um, I believe, you know, koinonia and fellowship and is so important because the Bible says know those who labor amongst you. And so, and even as we begin to grow together as a ministry, as a body of one, is getting to know one another, you know, um, so that we, you know, when you see that sister or see that brother and you can tell on their demeanor, on their countenance that they're going through something and you, because you've spent time with them and you know that, that face on, that face on their face ain't their face, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. You know, so I mean, and so that's, that's why I was just thinking, that's what, Sister Liz, as you were speaking, that's what came across my mind, Cornelia, fellowshipping and knowing one another is so vital. Sister Tanya, no, I'm not going to stop you. I'm just going to say, I'm going to need for you to grab a dictionary because I, I need to know that word that you're saying. Cornelia? Yeah, what is that? They come together, Cornelia, okay, fellowship. You, I, I just, oh. Yeah. <laughs> you bring that out. Okay. I'm sitting, I'm sitting there. I kind of figured what it was, okay. you know, but I. But As I said, I, fellowship thereafter, fellowship. I, yeah, yeah, I figured yeah. what it was, but okay. I was like, that's a new one on me. Okay. I never heard it. But okay. go ahead, sis. Well, yeah. Well, that's I was just you know, and and so you, as you as we began to know one another and began to do that fellowship and stuff and and all of that, then we can be able to be more trust the God in the individual or the individuals and and just know you know who you can go to and so and I know as we are in in our body as we are growing together, you know I can only speak for me. I'm having to you know learn people and and know you know. You know, you, you wrestle with stuff, and you go through stuff, and, and you try to, hey, you know, Deacon Kelly has his own time frame, but God has his, so as we just said, we make plans, we listen to God, so if you need to speak, speak. And it's hard, you know, I'm even, you know, and even in the midst of your own family, you know, and stuff like that. But um, just knowing, you know, who to holler out to, to say, okay, I need somebody to pray me. So a sis is, is going through this, that's a, hey, prime example, as we were saying, we have our own plans. God has his. There's a reason that we delayed. Um, the power of prayer in, this, in, in the body of Christ and the importance of the power of prayer, it goes back to what we're saying. Sis, I thank you for the question because the question is exactly what we're saying. You, you will know, and, and everybody said you get to know by fellowshipping together. You know, the more that you fellowship with somebody, the more that you receive. I'll be honest, I, I don't, I don't, I don't judge a person's prayer by how they pray up here necessarily. It's the content of what they pray, not how they pray. The content of what they pray and the life that they walk are what I hear them say in conversation. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes if I have a conversation and I hear you say certain things and be like, me and my wife might say, you know what? That's a praying, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I know they are, you know, we, we'll talk. And most of the time we'll be on the same page. And so when you, to know that, that's how you get to know the fruit by the fruit. And that's how, and the only way you're going to know the fruit is to, to fellowship, talk, have a conversation. We don't always have to go out to dinner or, you know, do stuff, but sometimes this simple conversation that you have with people, you'll begin to know the character of the person. And as we're coming together and we still, the merge is, you know, the merge is completed, but the transition is still taking place. Um, 
Yeah, I heard, I, I heard Trinity and Keen talking. I didn't mean anything wrong with saying that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but as the transition is still taking place, we are, steady, we are still getting to know each other. And you're knowing the leaders that you fellowship with. But I will say this, the leaders at this church, there are some leaders here, like um, Sister Chardin said, um, she had two comments. She said, I think that it's heartbreaking that so many people are scared to come to the church. And then she said, I believe God is going to guide you and show you and lead you to the right people if you pray. So as Sister Tanya well, you know, was saying, sometimes you don't know how to call out for help and you don't know who to go to. And so as you fellowship, you'll get to know. You know the character of people. You judge people by how they respond to other people. Don't go to somebody you hear talking about somebody else. I don't care if they're in the church or not. You don't do it. Just so you know, if they're talking about somebody else, what are they going to do about your business? You know? But you judge, you go, and you, you judge the character, and you watch how people fellowship. You watch their interactions, and you pray to God. And God's going to send you to the right person. With that being said, we're not leaving here until we read these two verses. <laughs> so somebody read verses 19 and 20. I think charisma beats to it. See. <laughs> All right, NLT verse nine. I mean nineteen. <laughs> I want to use you to read this. I need you to read these two. Okay. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. See, this is, the, oh, oh man. <laughs> I asked forgiveness on this when I read this in this lesson is because of a comment that was made about somebody saying I, about something, somebody they were worried about. And they said, I need y'all to pray for them. And my first response was, how many times we got to do that? And so, God, I ask your forgiveness tonight. And nobody know, needs to know who I'm talking about. But the point is, when it was said, that's what my first thought was. But when you hear this and you, and you see the importance of, you know, this is not, we're not talking about just going out and witnessing the people. We're talking to somebody who knows God. They have been in the fold and they left. And this particular, now they all are just as equally important. But do you, let's think about this for a moment. The fire going to be this hot for the people who didn't know God and just turned away. I mean, the people that didn't know him and didn't accept him. But the fire going to be this hot for the brothers and sisters who knew him, knew the truth, and walked away. And I have too much love for my people. I have too much love for God and for my brothers and sisters not to put an effort there to pray for them. And so when you read this, when I say you're restoring, it's like you, if you can do that and bring them back, you're saving them from certain death, not death on this earth. Because let's not get it twisted. There will be consequences for sin. And sometimes that consequence will be an early death. But we're talking about from certain death, that, etern that death that's going to keep you from eternal life. And, and that's, keep in mind, everything we do is for the long game. It's for the long game. It's not the short-term game. You know, because just because you come back to the church, but you've been out there sowing your wild oats, don't mean HIV ain't following you. You know, it just means that you're going to live your life for Jesus while you carry that HIV that you caught while you was out there. And it don't mean that God won't heal you eventually, because I've seen him do it. You know, but we're just saying, so for us as Christians, um, in the body, and we know our brothers and sisters are struggling, and they're out there, James is saying, don't leave them there, you know, because you're saving them from a certain death, you know, and by you doing that, it covers a multitude of sins, so that's the thing, you know, I have, we have brothers and sisters in the house, you know, in the church that we pray for, you know, when you find out certain things about people, you do what you got to do, but I ask God for the forgiveness because this particular situation, I failed. I still pray, but my first thought, and you know what I was telling you before, sometimes we got to get to the place where our first thought is not 
the, the wrong thing, but it's the right thing. My first thought was like, why? I mean, how many chances are you going to, you know, and I just went on with that tangent. Now, I still prayed eventually, but, you know, I, so I'm trying, to, I, I'm still working on that. But that's what James is saying, amen? That's it. Unless somebody has a comment to close it out, that's James going once, going twice. <laughs> And again, going back to the study part, that you are never too high to come back down mm -hmm. to meet people where they are. And if you get to a place where you can't meet people where they are, then you, you ain't no good. Because that's what this is saying right now. If I know my brother and sister know, and I feel like because I'm two steps ahead that I can't go back for my own brother or sister. Nah, can't do that. Just can't do it. And I just think we, I think sometimes when we don't go back because we're not strong enough to go back. Mm. So I think we, And I say that to say this, because sometimes we can move forward and your brother and sister see you moving forward and can feel that you are leaving them behind and that you don't care. But it's not that I don't care, it's that I can't help you for helping myself. And I think it's a twofold you got to get yourself in a place to recognize or get somebody who can help your brother and sister that's back there. Because you see it and you know it. But I, again, we such crabs to where <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. Shit, me before you go. And we forget. Before you go. Hmm? Oh, I, was about, I thought you was going to the noise. I was about, <laughs> what the hell doing? <laughs> Are you happy to see me? No. You jumped up running. I was like, where are you going? <laughs> Sorry, sis. I was just yeah, that's I okay. I, I, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> sis. Mm. That was a good one. Uh, Brother D? Yeah, um, I'm sorry. <coughs> well, since we're sitting there talking, I, I kept, I read this over again, and there's one word that really hit me um, looking at these last two verses, and uh, it's simply just transparency, right? So, um, and I think these two scriptures really hit me because, you know what? I was that guy, right? So, in the body, I'm, I'm, I'm what this verse is talking about, right? So, I knew the word, right? I grew up in churches. I knew all this stuff. And I still went back out, right? So it, this, these two verses in James, right, somebody went back out and got me, right? Someone prayed for me. Uh, my wife kept me in prayer, you know. I walked away from church. I walked away from God, right? She kept praying. And the crazy thing about it is, you know, when I walked away, it, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle because 
as I walked away, it became an issue to where my kids began to follow it, right? Mm -hmm. So when I read these two scriptures, and I kept reading it as minister was just speaking, right? It wasn't the fact that I didn't want somebody to come get me, right? It was just that, you know, it's a shame. You know, you, you feel ashamed. You feel defeated. And, you know, it's, it's hard to come back, especially, like, like she said, when you know better, right? Because you know the word. You know, mm -hmm. what, you know what you're supposed to be doing. You know you're calling, but you just, you're stuck. You know, you're stuck. You feel defeated. You know, you have the devil, as they say, on your back, right? And this, this is just, I mean, I feel it. I feel this whole two scriptures because, you know, and it's not the fact that somebody didn't want to come back and get me. It was just I felt so down at that point in time. I didn't want to be God. I didn't want nobody to come back and get me, you know. So, <laughs> you know, when I look at this, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful, you know, because I even made a, <laughs> you know, share a little small testimony. I even made a whole, I think some of y'all know, I made a whole vow that I never stepped foot in the church again. You know, those of y'all that know me. And I didn't step foot in the church. But God, you know, our God, my God, I serve is a very funny God. Because those of y'all know, I didn't step foot in the church. I did, though. But it was in a house <laughs> where I met y'all. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, if it wasn't for my wife praying, if it wasn't for running into the Kellys and the Minister Burnett and the RJ and, you know, running into the Stearns, you know, I would still be that brother out there wandering, you know. So th this, these two scriptures, you know, it really hits home to me. But you know what? It also makes me realize, you know, the calling I've always known. You know what I mean? I, I, this, this scripture really hits home to me because, you know, I, I charge it to myself because I got to go back and get these cats because I was this cat. That's it. Amen. So th 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 this, I see you, sis. And we're going we're gonna to close. I see you. Oh, okay. We're good. <laughs> So one of the things that this, and I wanted to end, I wanted to make sure we got to these last sections of James, because we talk about the power of prayer, but then we talk about the power of restoration. Amen. See, the key to, to this whole walk when we're talking about this, and I love the way, even though people say James didn't put a particular order to what he talked about, but look how we talked about judgment and not passing judgment, but versus accountability and now we talk about being able to go and pray for one another how can somebody come to you for prayer or even receive you coming to them if they think you're going to be passing hypocritical judgment on them versus holding them accountable for what you know they already know see because when you hold somebody accountable accountability comes with love judgment doesn't and that's the difference. So if you see your brother and sister out there and you come to hold them accountable, they know you're coming in love. And that's the difference. Because accountability comes with love. We have, you know, there's times where we hold each other accountable and you let them know, look, I'm not, I wouldn't be your brother and sister if I didn't tell you the truth. I cannot say I love you if I don't tell you the truth. And that's the key. So I thank God for this lesson on James. It gave us a wide range of things to talk about, um, to think, a wide range of things to study. If you take the practical principles of it all from everything that we've talked about, um, it gives us a lot to look at. The key to it now is everybody that's been here, everybody that goes back and look online, everybody that watches it later or watches it in the future, you are now accountable. You're always accountable, but you are now really accountable. And that accountability will come with test. You know, you will be tested on this now. Because it, with knowledge, comes, it has to come elevation and growth. Okay? So that's what we are. And for everybody that's online, uh, don't worry about it. We're closing out. Just, we switch in. Don't worry about it, Shanice. Just leave it on the other one. Because um, we're done. Battery on the, the front camera died, y'all. No problems. We're going to switch on the side one because we're about to close out. With that being said, um, we will know about Bible study next week. I'm not sure if we'll have Bible study or prayer. Um, Pastor will let us know for the next series, what the next series is going to be, when the next series is going to start. 
um, for this particular series. Um, thank God for it. It has been a wonderful time teaching it. Um, I said we was going to have homework, and the homework is the, the practical livings of this. This last one, guys, I really, my, our homework now, if everybody's just listening in live, listening to this, is get your prayer life in order. Into a point to where you know who you can go to in the house to get a prayer through for you when you need it. But also prepare yourself for when your brother and sister might need to come to you. And as the leaders, you hear what the word of God said, we have to put ourselves, because he did call leaders out specifically, but he also called everybody else out. But be, we have to put ourselves in position and make ourselves available for people to be comfortable coming to us. Amen? So that's your homework. Find somebody to pray about, pray for them this week, this week. That's all I'm saying. Because I know I'm just full right now. But thank God for it. That's Bible study. Don't forget Sunday school this Sunday, 10 o'clock. Amen, amen, amen. Um, we're going to be branching out in classes starting in July. So anybody that still wishes to teach a class in Sunday school, please contact myself or Deacon Wise. Let us know. We want to have a meeting um, in the next few days to kind of pass everything out and get every, all of that together to finalize the teaching list. But that's what we're going to do. We will have Sunday school this Sunday, 10 o'clock. When we start in July, we're going to push the time up early after we meet with the teachers. It'll probably be 945, but this Sunday, 10 o'clock. Amen? Um, if you have an offering, please get it in your hand. Be prepared to... Um, I'm sorry. I was reading... It was just a lot of confirmation comments. Amen? So if you have an offering, get it in your hand, and we're going to close out in prayer. Tonight, any, we still have mics out? Nope. No, don't worry. I'll pray. Um, all right, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for a wonderful lesson. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come into your house. God, I thank you personally for the fellowship, and I thank you, God, for the opportunity to be used by you to facilitate this word tonight, God. But we come to you, God, even thanking you, God, for the hearts that were heard tonight, the questions that was asked, the insight that was given, God. Now that we have been given this, I pray, God, that we will chew on this word, we will digest this word, God, and we will not hoard this word that we will go out and share this word with somebody else, Father, that we will live this word out, we will walk this word out, for it's a whole lot easier to hear the word and to read the word than to live the word. And now it's time for us to live it and time to walk it out. So give us strength, give us the endurance, God, to endure and to walk out the things that you have given us to teach. Bless our leaders in their absence, God. I mean, they've been on vacation um, this um, past few weeks, God. I pray that you continue to be with them um, and strengthen them, God. Renew them and restore them so that they can continue to do the work and follow the visions that you have given them. Bless the offering that we're about to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry for everybody that was um, listening. I forgot. We have a, a Young Adult Ministry Ice Cream Fellowship on Thursday night. And what time? They're going to send out a message. <laughs> 7 o'clock, 18 to 35. I, I, I don't do the ages, so y'all can take that up with them. I'm sure they won't fuss if you 36, uh, 37, amen.